Hey Weirdos, it's my The Cosmic Nomad, and today on the podcast we have Rob Issa, and he's a writer-director, and he's recently worked on a small documentary based in Toronto, and you can find him on Instagram at RobLit0, that's R-O-B-L-I-T, and the number zero. The short documentary that he's worked on is called Mending a Crack in the Sky, and I've also worked on that for the cover and the visuals and uh, unit stills on that documentary. Rob is an interesting guy based in Toronto, and he's emerging, and he's fucking amazing. So check him out today on the podcast. Um, I don't see myself normally on that one, but because I have to minimize OBS. It's a whole fucking thing. But I'll count us in, and then we'll start from there, man. So just don't worry about Let's... anything. Obviously, I'm just going to ask you, it's more about you as a creative and everything like that. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Is this the, how long have you been doing this? I took a break literally for half the year. I started um, last, like early last year and then pre- previously, like I took intermittent breaks. And then I'm like, yeah. I got to get this thing back going because number one, I already like talking to people and I meet a shit ton of people all the time that are, you know, like yourself, amazing people. And I'm like, a lot of these people need to be seen. And it's like I told you before about the magazine years and years ago, that's exactly what it was. I kept meeting talented people and I'm like, why doesn't anybody know these people? You know what I mean? So if I can bring more light to people, I'm like, I don't know, it's nice. It's really nice. Because people have done that for me. You know what I mean? So it's it's always a good thing. By the way, we're, we're recording, so it doesn't really matter. We're just talking right now because it's essentially just me and you talking. Yeah, so it's just yeah. So like, where where do you usually upload these? I usually like, up- do up- I usually upload these. I have. When did I start doing? I started doing this, I think three about three years ago, and and then I took it more seriously as the time went on. And I'm on Spotify, Google, Apple, uh, YouTube um and a bunch of other ones like uh, I, i've already had the system and, and and the branding and everything set up for a long long time and it's already been there it's just a matter of um putting things up so i interviewed people that i knew uh i don't know if you remember david uh sherman that was on uh that horror film yeah the dp right yeah the dp i i did a, yeah. there's an interview of him that is both audio and video so one is on youtube and the other one's on spotify and stuff like that I interviewed uh, another friend of mine who was a photographer. Uh, I interviewed uh, another friend that was um, this, uh, I think she, she was a writer, but she also did uh, interior design, I believe. But yeah, so, and then I was like, I got to get back. Like, that was the beginning of the year, too. That was the beginning of COVID. Yeah. It was like last year, 2020. And I'm like, I got to continue this thing because I kind of liked it. And the amount of people that wanted to sit down and talk to me. And then within a week, I already have you and two other people back on this whole thing so it's just it's interesting plus i'll talk to muna when i'm there physically and back in toronto and i'll talk to holva as well and i'll talk to sheko sheko's down as well and just and even tony remember i don't know if you remember tony from uh the dp from muna's event yeah yeah and me and tony were in the same uh, pa program yeah that's where i met my guy what's he saying he he went back to is he going back to Ghana? I think he, he wants to go back. Last time I talked to him, he wanted to go back, and mm-hmm. that's why his message was like, "Did you go back, man?" And he's like, "No, nah, I didn't go back yet." I was like, oh, "Perfect, I'll be back at this time. Uh, let's do this." And I, he goes, eh, "Okay, then let's just do Zoom before you leave." So I have him tomorrow, and then I have another friend. I don't know if you met her. You were supposed to meet her one time at my friend Isaac's place, and she uh, she's um, uh, AD. And she worked on Kim's Convenience for so long and things like that. And her name is Lauren uh, Guyatt. So a lot of these, I'm trying to get all these film people, all these other creative people, and some here and some other countries and things like that. So it's... Yeah, yeah. you know everybody, bro. Why not put it to use? Mm-hmm. Take it. Bring all these people out into the world because there's so much, like I said, there's so much fucking talented people. And they and they don't get, as, as drink champs, what does the drink champs say? I'm giving your flowers basically before you go rather than just giving you like when you die type of thing. And it's essentially yeah. that because there's a lot of fucking amazing people. And when it comes to Somalis too, I'm like, you put like what was going on in Toronto on the spotlight and that was really good. And Alhamdulillah, I was like, that was pretty good. And 
grateful that you also uh, put me on that as well. And let's talk about that as well. So there's a lot of things we can talk about. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, sure. You're, uh, so, you're great on that. We're still using all those promo picks and <laughs> so many things to go through. I'm happy because I. The thing is, a lot of people they 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 tag me after the fact, right? And then I, I'm also forgetful that I did this and I did that. And I'm like, oh shit, that. Yeah, he put that up. That's fucking dope. I haven't seen that in a long time because technically I'm not supposed to use them until you guys use them or something like that. And yeah. and then I find out months or even a year later, I'm like, well, lie, I forgot about that whole thing. You know, so it's yeah. it's amazing to see. So, yeah, how did that yeah. process start? How did that process start of getting this whole documentary together? How did that process start? And getting... Um, Getting together with Zach, who's uh, another uh, person on the project that is uh, is a director, correct? Co-directors. Co-director, yeah. 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 So essentially, this started off in um, let's say November two thousand nineteen. Mm-hmm. Basically, I saw these two uh, Somali mothers. They were on um, breakfast television. They were talking about like how they lost their sons to gun violence, and they came together to to form this group that kind of like combated those issues that led to their sons dying basically mm-hmm. and they, they had grown to like over a hundred mothers they were meeting every single week on at 7 a.m every saturday and just like having meetings with cops as politicians all these just doing all these great initiatives in the community so just seeing that i reached out to um the guy named mahad he's the executive director of uh this place called medenta medenta basically um they basically support the mothers from this group, which is uh, called Mending a Crack in the Sky. So they give them like the space to meet and all that. So I kind of just reach out to him. I was like, listen, I want to come out, bring my camera, just kind of document like what these, what these women are doing in the community. At the time, I didn't really know like what I was going to do with it. I just kind of felt like this is like some specials happening here. So I just wanted to go and like document it. And originally I wanted to do it as a feature. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I started going to their meetings every Saturday for like months. And then um, after about four months, the lockdown happened. So they weren't having those meetings anymore. They moved everything virtual. So there was kind of like a break there yeah. for maybe like six months or so. Um, and then things were starting to open back up slowly. So I, I kind of wanted to reach out to somebody to, to help me produce the doc. So I went on... Um, I believe I found Zach on the CBC uh, site where it says the producers, like independent producers. On CBC. And he was gems. Is on, on the gems um, website or is it just CBC? Like, is there a specific? I don't, know, I don't remember if it was gems or just CBC, but they have a page on CBC.com mm-hmm. where it's like they have a list of independent producers, like from the, I don't know if it's from the city or all around the country, but um, Zach was the only Somali uh, producer I saw on there. Mm-hmm. So I just I looked into his stuff. He had did another doc for um, Al Jazeera. He did another one for CBC. So I just kind of reached out to him, like, "Hey, listen, I'm looking for a producer for this project. Can you kind of come on board and like help me out?" I just kind of broke down like the entire story for him. He was like, um, he kind of he wasn't the producer, but he kind of came on board as a bit of like consultant at first. Okay. And then it turned out that we both had like. Um, these mirrorless cameras that were the same it was the same Panasonic GH5. Oh, so you so have two like, GH5s, or is it GH5 yeah. and GH5? Was it S? Yeah, mine was the S, and he had the GH5, and he, he um, so I told him like I'm looking to start doing interviews with like politicians, with members of the community and stuff for this feature. So he's like, "Yo, I'll come out! I'll, I'll be like a B cam. I'll, I'll bring my GH5 out." So we started doing these interviews together. Then we, after a certain point, we just kind of decided like to bring him on board as a co-director, just because we're kind of both doing the same type of thing where we're bringing like ideas to the table and like conducting the interviews together. So um, when he came on board to do that, maybe I want to say a month or two later, Hot Ducks had put out this, um, this call for Com- they were trying to commission 10 short docs, eight minutes each, yeah. that dealt with civic engagement in the community. So there was this whole, at first I had gotten that application from um, 
from someone at Hot Docs because I, I applied for funding for the feature like the year prior mm -hmm. or about six months prior. So she had remembered that um, I applied there. So she was like, I think you're a good fit for this uh, grant that we're doing, this new initiative. Um, at first, honestly, I kind of ignored it because I, I was still in this like mode where I was like, yeah, I can't do this. I can't do this story justice in eight minutes. You know, this is it was still a feature in my mind. So I kind of ignored it. And then um, Zach sent it to me as well. The exact same application. He's like, what do you think about this? I was still in that mode where I'm like, no, this has to be a feature. I can't do it. Because no, you saw then, in a certain vision, you saw that this is it just it needs to be explored deeper but at the same time yeah. yeah it's something's better than nothing and just yeah yeah so when zach when zach told me that i i started to think about it but i still wasn't like i was still kind of hesitant about it and i got it from a third person um which is another filmmaker in the city that i've worked with before that whose opinion i really value a lot so she had sent it this so now this was a third person that sent me the application. So I'm like, okay, right, maybe there is something here. Mm -hmm. Once I actually looked through the application, I was like, yeah, this this does kind of fit like what they're doing. And we kind of use this eight minutes as just like an introduction and maybe get funding to do a feature or just at the very least get their story out there, give them that platform, right? Yeah. So we applied for it maybe a month or two later. Um, we got shortlisted down to like, I think the last 15, we had a Zoom interview. Um, and then they ended up choosing um, our story as one of the eight that they were going to commission. This was December of last year when they made that decision. And then basically January, we started on it. And then we had to deliver it to Hot Docs by um, April. Oh, wow. So we had those three months to do like. That's a short turnaround. It is. It is. And honestly, like the way we pitched it before was kind of like we're going to follow these moms into different homes to like um, follow them as they kind of do like their jobs and like go to these grieving mother's houses and all this stuff. But at that time, like the restrictions got really bad for COVID. I don't know if you remember it, but yeah, you um, couldn't. You were telling me that you couldn't go really into. Sick. Yeah, you told me that you couldn't go into certain people's houses or, you know, other people weren't. Yeah they're reticent to allow you in yeah you couldn't you basically you couldn't do anything like we thought we weren't even gonna get a chance to even do the film like the film was like in jeopardy at one point just because the restrictions were like so strict mm. um so we, so from there we basically had to pivot and decide like how, how are we going to shoot this when we can't follow them as they go into people's homes and stuff so um it ended up being kind of a different film but it was more of like an interview style and like all the other stuff was outdoors. We weren't really following them into anybody's houses and stuff. So, but yeah, we did that. We got it done, submitted it. Um, it played a hot dogs end of April. Um, since then it's been in, I think 10 film festivals. It's now on Crave for the next 18 months. So that's big, man. Yeah. It turned out really well. So it's, happy with it. it's always the things that you, you know it can be bigger than what it is, but then you don't realize by at least taking a certain risk that it will grow into this other thing that you that you really didn't think in the beginning, but you, you know what I mean? Like, it's weird to explain. And now it's, yeah. it's, it's becoming your calling card. If you really think about it, it's like your resume. It's like, this guy did this and it's still in rotation. That's fucking dope. Yeah, for so, sure. One thing you gotta you gotta be ready to just like i find in this industry there's so many things that like you don't plan that end up being like the best things so you gotta be able to just like roll with those punches you know yeah ride the wave and yeah. um so in terms of the process of like was hot docs involved i think we talked about this uh off camera but was hot mm -hmm. docs involved in terms of uh submitting this uh finished product to other festivals and other places and other platforms or was it just you alone um so they hired a an impact producer that just kind of came up with like a plan on like how to get the most out of these projects mm -hmm. um so they helped with the crave deal um 
uh, there's also a docs for school thing where they basically like create a curriculum around it mm -hmm. uh, teach in schools so they they help with that but the the individual um, film festival submissions that was kind of like left to us uh -huh. docs gave us money to use the for the fees but we were just kind of like left to choose like which ones we thought it fit into and stuff so that part was kind of left to us which was good oh, that's pretty good so yeah your whole film process how did you get into the whole film process for those that you know till this day there's a lot of people that don't know how to get into it at least in in like at least without going to school because for me i didn't i tried to go to school and i told you before like it didn't work out so i kind of came in at a different route over time but how did you get into this whole industry like what was yeah, the spark so, for you to like be like eh, i gotta get the fuck in this industry this seems nice this is yeah. what i want to do yeah so for me I, I also didn't go to film school um I went to school for psychology, so I had like no film background. I didn't know anybody in the film industry, nothing. Um, the way I kind of started is I've always liked writing and I always thought I was going to like write novels and like short stories and stuff like that. And I kind of started with that route. And then somehow over the years, I just discovered uh, screenwriting, which I felt just kind of like fit me better. Uh -huh. um, and I think the first time I was on set was, um, maybe 2018. Mm -hmm. um, I remember just volunteering for this, like, there was this call out on uh, Indeed, I volunteered for it. And they had like all these different volunteer roles. And I just signed up to be a script supervisor. And at the time, I had like no idea what a script supervisor <laughs> did. I just knew, <laughs> I just knew it was like something to do with script. And I was coming from that background. So I'm like, all right, this is what I want to do. And then they're like, um, they give me the script. The next day I had to be on set and work as a script supervisor. So the day before I'm just like Googling, what is a script supervisor? That's <laughs> all, that you got the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, for those that don't know, tell what the general um, job description is for a script supervisor. Yeah. So a script supervisor is like, is one of the only departments that's like a one person department. Like all these other departments, you have like other people you can lean on. But with the script supervisor, you're basically just making sure that um, the continuity is right. Like if someone has their cup in one hand on the left hand in one scene, the next scene, they can't have it in like the right hand. They can't, the glass can't be like full one scene and like empty the next and make sure everybody's in the right place from scene to scene. Everyone has the right clothes, everything. So basically just continuity and making sure that you're getting all the, everything in the script basically. Yeah. You gotta be a very OCD person to like ha yeah. manage that role smoothly to a certain degree. Um, cause I've seen I think it's like the most underrated, underrated job on set. If you can get it, you're very valuable. If you're a script supervisor, you're very yeah. valuable. And I've seen people floating through different sets and constantly getting gigs because if your personality is good, and you do your job really a lot of people like you and it's set you're you're good especially in that role so for a lot of people yeah. that are listening a script supervisor if you think you're organized and you can keep keep people on point and you're also visual because you got to see what's going on all around you all the time you know through dialogue through we've done the scene we didn't do the scene etc cetera, etc cetera, what take except all that stuff so you got to be on point go for that yeah it's tough I've never done it again, but I've, I've a, I have a lot of respect for script supervisors. Oh yeah. But um, so yeah, that was the first um, time I was on set. From there, I just started going to like different networking events. Like I went on like all the Facebook pages and stuff just to get on set. And at this point, I just wanted to be a screenwriter. I just wanted to be somebody that wrote scripts and somebody else would direct it. And um, so at the end of 2018, I ended up writing a short film that uh, someone else was directing. Um, I think that was the second time I was on set. Mm -hmm. third time. Um, and then from there, I just kind of realized, like, if I'm going to be writing the script and spending all this time on it, I, I wanted to be the one that uh, directed and kind of, like, see the whole project through. So that's when I started learning more about directing, reading every book on directing I could find, watching every YouTube video. Um, just trying to learn everything I could really. 
and I was just continuing to go to like different networking events. Um, I would just do all types of jobs. Like I would do um, locations, PA, grip, literally anything, just like volunteering. Mm-hmm. And then in 2019, I got into POV Third Street and C Toronto. They had a, it was like the first year they were doing a PA training program. Oh, okay. So I applied, I applied for that, got into that. And that's that's when I really like started getting on sets because they would put you on set as a PA mm-hmm. and kind of teach you a little bit about like every kind of department on set. So um, I think the first thing I did as a PA on there was um, Great Goose commercial um, and just some like smaller stuff that I would find like through networking. And then uh, that first feature I PA'd on where as a locations PA, that's where I met you. Oh yeah, the horror that. film. That was like, yeah. The horror film. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Orangeville, was it? Yeah, it was Orangeville, Ontario. It was like a drive. Not a crazy, crazy drive, but it was at least over, just an hour or over an hour, I think it was. At least for me. Um, yes, for me it was about so that, closer to an hour and a half, I'd say. Hour 15-ish. Yeah, because we we're like... Yeah. No, then it should have been shorter for you, so then it's longer for me. It was longer for me to drive because I was coming from uh, North York. Uh, and you were coming from the West End, correct? No, I was coming from uh, North York as well. Oh, okay. Then... then... Yeah, so then about the same time. But uh, yeah, that yeah. set was uh, interesting because the whole weather changed throughout the, the shooting days. It was raining and disgusting, and then it went to cold, and then it went back to raining a bit, and then it went to snow. By the end of the production, it was snow. And was that was tough. And then somebody had to go into the water, a, a dirt like a semi-dirty pond. It was like, it was a whole thing. And uh, that's also where we, where I met, and you also met uh, David Sherman, uh, the DP on that on that set, in that production. But you were yeah. locations uh, assistant, right? Yeah, I was a locations PA, and I was like, and for anybody that doesn't know locations, is always like the first one on set, last one to leave. It is not an easy job. Hour and a half drive, hour and a half back, and. Those days were what, like sixteen-hour shooting days or something. It was crazy. And that's basically like half, half the job was just like pushing cars out of the mud. Like I got stuck. You remember that? Like how many cars? Dude, would get stuck. The car? moment I got on set. So for people that don't know, on, on that set I was uh, unit stills, which is basically the photographer that shoots uh, behind the scenes um, and also um, what they call gallery uh, images, which is like the posters, all the you know assets that they will use to promote the film and for me the moment i got on set i touched no cars i was literally nowhere near the cars every time i saw you or i saw mark or all these other people i was like oh fuck i feel bad for them i really want to like get in the car but i also like dude you got a chill job why are you i'm being honest like you you got a chill job what are you what are you doing plus there's another thing there's another rule though on sets that just do your job. There's a certain level of like courtesy. You can help people with certain things, but on average, don't like uh, overstep to someone else's um, workload or things like that. And yeah, it's, it's it's a weird thing. Yeah, some people are very um, uh, annoyed that you do that sometimes. And then and then I'm like, yeah, okay, I was just trying to be nice. All right, cool, 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 cool. So you got to learn these things uh, as you go along on set. Yeah, but yeah, you guys went through the mud, man. Fuck, holy shit! Yeah, literally, and it, it was on a farm too, so it was like not real this... roads. Yeah, it was tough. Damn. Um. So yeah, I did that. That was the end of what 2019, right? Yeah, it was no- October, November 2019, just before COVID. Then the whole thing started a couple of months later. Yeah. So after that, I did maybe one or two PA jobs after that, and I was done with PA. And I was like, "This is, I've gotten what I, what I need out of this." Like, and I, like I said, I had this little GH5 camera, and I had actually met with the moms to start doing the documentary maybe two weeks after we wrapped that that film. So oh, wow. I was just, gonna, yeah, I was just focusing like all my energy on that basically. Um, 
just trying to do my own thing. I was doing like freelance videography, editing. Um, I also had a day job, so I didn't have to really do the PA stuff anymore. Um, and then, yeah. So and the uh, hot dog thing happened and here we are. <laughs> so in terms of what would you advise like people that are trying to get into this industry? Like what steps to avoid, what steps to take, what is necessary that everybody has to go through um, and then we'll go from there, essentially. Yeah. yeah, I would say the most important thing I would say is networking for sure. Like yep. that's, especially if you, if you don't have any connection to the industry, there's always stuff going on in Toronto. I don't know how it is now because I haven't been to anything like that recently, but before the pandemic, there was always stuff going on. So just join like all those Facebook groups. Like I need a crew, I need this, that. Yeah, I need there was posting by like, yeah. Different no, so uh, yeah. going to literally any like um, networking event, volunteering, just just trying to get on set as much as possible, basically. And then once you do get on set, just try to learn as much as you can, and then just know like when to move on. I know a lot of people like end up staying, <laughs> doing PA and doing yeah, different that's... things for like long. Yeah, it's some some people are like it's weird to say, but some people are amazing PAs and they don't they don't lose their mind. Let's just say they don't lose their mind in that position because it, it's a very depending on the production, depending on the people you work with, it could be super chill, but it's very hard, um, and it's not for everybody. Same thing with uh, grips and things like that. If you love tech, if you love things. And it's it's very physical and labor intensive the grips and um, because you can fuck up your hands those guys I'm always worried that those um, those old uh, fucking huge lights forgot the name of them would uh, and the on the on the um, on the stands would come down and clamp your fingers like if you don't have gloves or anything like that or you don't ease up slowly as you go down it'll fucking like smash your fingers so yeah all that shit. But stuff yeah. for sure it's some people like you said are happy with being pas and that's what they want to do so like it's not to take any shots at them or anything yeah. it's just like it's just like ask yourself why did you get into it you know that's what i had to do basically like what and for me it was still right and direct right mm -hmm. and i always used to think like oh, i'll start as a pa i'll move up to grip i'll move up to this make my way to that director's chair yeah, but it honestly, doesn't work like that at all. Oh no, it's like... people get the thing. The hilarious thing is, people get what I found out is like people get mad at you if you bypass the traditional way of going through the system where you have to pay your dues. I understand if you pay your mm -hmm. dues in terms of if you're in a union, but in life it doesn't work like that. In reality, it does not work like I have to be a PA, then I have to be this, then I have to be that. Then years later, I'll become the director, or years later, I'll become this. Like, no, listen. The universe doesn't work like that. I know it doesn't work like that. So that's a whole other thing. Yeah, exactly. Like, if you want to be a director, like, go out and direct something. That's honestly the only path there is. Like, yep. and that's not to say being a PN stuff is not useful. Like, I learned a lot doing that. But it's just after a certain point, you're you're not really um, helping yourself if you want to do it. Be a director, or be um, an AD, or be whatever you know. Yeah, so you have to it's take just that risk. Yeah, you have to just ask yourself like what why did I get into it? What do I want out of this? And just take that the necessary steps to do that. So once you feel like you've gotten what you need to get out of being a PA or being a grip or being whatever you, it is, you just gotta know what when to move on basically. Yeah. And then you just have to shoot stuff, man. Even if it's on like a little iPhone or whatever, you know, you just gotta make stuff if that's what you wanna do. Yeah, there's there's films, big films, that are filmed on. I think it was the iPhone 10 when it came out, and it's a whole feature film. And or yeah. I think it was Tangerine. Uh, that yeah, director's... Tangerine was shot on like the iPhone 5, I think. So. Yeah, or yeah. I think it was um, uh, that film with Willem Dafoe. At the end of it, it was they're at Disneyland and it was filmed on a cell phone. Because I think you can film. They didn't have the rights to film. I think the same director oh, yeah. as Tangerine. I think so. Yeah, the Florida project. The Florida yeah, project. Yeah. 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 So, at the end of the day, you just got to know your tools. 
just go for it because everything's accessible to you because the same cameras like this is an iPhone 8 you know so this shoots 4k you know what I mean yeah what especially these you? days these iPhones are ridiculous now bro yeah okay 60 frames it's crazy what they're doing yeah and you just get yourself a gimbal a cell phone gimbal uh, and there you go you get your audio like I literally just have this shotgun mic and this is for either a phone or a camera and that's at least for um just basic audio but then you can you know make your own boom mics you can hire other people etc cetera, etc cetera. you get build a team you know and network as you're saying earlier because networking is huge because they yeah. don't post jobs the film industry that's doesn't the yeah go ahead yeah yeah networking is definitely the biggest key like we're talking about that feature we did which was uh produced by lauren grant and she ended up producing my uh short doc as well uh-huh. and that was just through, like the connection of like meeting her on that set and then a year later she's directing mine so yeah yeah a lot the industry is so like, small like there's so many connections like that that especially here in toronto so just try to meet as many people in the industry as you can that like fit uh, what you're trying to do and like work well with you and just I agree that's right and in yeah. terms of now your transition from as you said a PA or all these other positions on set to now yeah. being an act like a bona fide director because you have stuff out there that says you're a director and a writer so that transition what like in between that uh, documentary and um, prior to that or even now is there any like, you know, resources that you use to help you, you know, write better or, you know, cause a lot of people have issues with uh, story structure, formatting, et cetera. It's easy formatting. That's more of a software thing nowadays, but story structure. Mm-hmm. And for me, I know that that was the first thing that was a barrier to me. It wasn't the tools or the format. It was the story structure that messed me up in the beginning yeah like for me like i said i started with the screenwriting so that's that was always like where i felt more comfortable with the writing more so than like the actual production aspect like i think the hardest part for me to learn was like um the technical stuff like what lenses to use in certain situations uh, composition like all those kind of technical aspects Mm -hmm. but as far as the structure and all that that's like Obviously, I'm still learning, but that's where I feel stronger at than those technical aspects. So um, I want to do like more narrative stuff. So as far as the documentary, it doesn't really help us with the structure part of it, mm-hmm. but it definitely helps with more with like the technical aspects of it and just like things like finding a crew, things like um, finding like what you need to rent on a certain day to get like what you need to get, the post-production process, all those kind of things is where it really helped. And then now I'm kind of like back in the screenwriting phase where I'm like going back to that. So that's what I've really been focused on now. It's the screenwriting. No, oh, that's good. Yeah. Cause when it comes to, yeah, there's a, there's different styles of uh, whether it's commercial or narrative and then there's um, documentary style. So documentary style, you need more run and gun for the most part. Sometimes you can, you know set up interviews that are more controlled in an environment but then there's other times where you need a running gun setup that works best you know what i mean for in terms of technical gear and it's good to learn all these different styles you know for sure and everything's available to you you didn't have too much run like most of the running gun stuff uh we did was just stuff that i shot before when I was just had the camera moving around with them. But as far as the stuff we shot, like after the hot dogs thing was more like, it was more just like sit down interviews and like structured stuff. So we weren't really doing too much run and gun, but mm-hmm. yeah, I was doing a, a lot of that before the hot dog stuff. Yeah. So you gotta be more, you gotta be versatile. So, cause there's a lot of people that came from documentary and then went to narrative or narrative to documentary or back and forth and they just do it interchangeably. And, and it's just adaptive being adaptive to the different needs of like different subject matter or different situations yeah. and locations yeah for sure you're still telling a story at the end of the day it's just kind of like different like you're just using different measures to do it right yeah, yeah. now 
<laughs> more recently, what has happened is there was the first uh, Somali direct, written and directed film that came out recently. And the name, the title of the name varies. It goes from Guled and Nasra to The Gravedigger's Wife. I think the North American releases The Gravedigger's Wife. I think the UK and North American release. And then the rest of the world was on um, Guled and Nasra. And that's uh, uh, Khadar uh, Ali. Is it Khadar Ali? Uh, Idris? I, I, he has three names. Like everyone has three names. Every Somali person has three names. And I know it's Khadar. First name is Khadar. Idris. Uh, is it Ahmed? It is. Sorry if I'm butchering your name, Khadar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at things. People that sure know me, sure. So we don't bother. Yeah, them. because that's the thing. People that know me, I'm good with faces. I will remember your face for years, and even if you've grown older, I'll remember that. But names, and I tell this when I meet people, I say I'm not good with names. I'm sorry. I will remember your face because yeah. I'm like whatever. I'm it's the same what I'm is the this one? It's Khadar. So let me check. Idris Ahmed. So it's Khadar Idris Idris or Idris. Pronunciation See, for those non Somali people, Idris or Idrus? I don't know. Idris. Idris. I believe. Yeah. Um, I but yeah, so we, we recently they showed at TIFF and they, they did a Zoom thing. And from there, uh, I was like, there's all these Toronto people that are in film. I knew already uh, uh, you. And I was like, oh, word. And then I didn't know someone else was, uh, you know, my sister and them's friend. I was like, oh, shit, I didn't even know. So it's like, the, it's, the whole thing is, it's, it's not a widely, um, it's not that, I would say this, it's more of Somalis don't network well when it comes to art, honestly, unless it's music. Mm -hmm. Like if you're a rapper, you're a Somali rapper, and then you're like, yeah, everybody knows this guy and that guy in the city. But when it comes to outside of that, there's a lot of people uh, that we don't know work in the industry in terms of film. And to yeah. know that there are a good amount of people is always beautiful to see because then there will be people that at least if you want to approach, whether producers, writers, directors, and so on, that can understand your vision and your background and can relate to it more so uh, when it comes to even creating your own story if you need help with it. And even that is a good resource to have. So I'm grateful that I know that resource now uh, compared to back then. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of us, especially here in Toronto. There's so many Somali creatives, like in the film industry. It's crazy. Yeah. It's yeah. So I was telling you that we should all like get together, do something, because we have, we have producers, writers, directors, you know, cinematographers, stills. You have everything. Actors, everything. And yeah. Even the fact that it's how okay to me the way I view it is like it's hilarious because as much as I'm I'm not on TikTok or any like I Instagram is the only thing I really use but there's like this yeah. a happy thing that was like oh that's big and then you have this film the Somali film the Gravedigger's Wife that is big and I'm like what is going on of all times like this is colliding everyone is like singing the song and dancing to the song and then you also have this movie that has gotten cans has gotten tiff has gotten i think it was in bafta or got at least got an award i think one of um either um Khadr or uh umar who is the who's the actor got an award uh from all these it's, so it's it's fucking amazing and it's putting somalis in a different light than was you know captain phillips honestly awesome film not the best portrayal you know what I'm trying to say of Somalis. So, but could have been worse. So <laughs> at least, at least, they, at least they casted Somalis. At least they were speaking Somali. That's true. Like, Compared yeah. to Black Hawk Down, you know that was some Black Hawk Down. You know everybody knows he had the skinnies on the roof <laughs> when it came to <laughs> Toronto. But, <laughs> but uh, no, it's good, and I'm happy because it also, as me and you are, those that don't know, like you just created this documentary. And you're you're also working on other projects. And myself, I'm also working on other projects, and they're Somali related. And rather than, you know, at least from my opinion, going into only what happened in the war, granted that can be talked about at any time, and it's like, you know, from at least my perspective, it's easy pickings to a certain degree. But there's yeah. stories that all of us go through or have went through or anything like that, and we want to see more narrative things like the Gravedigger's Wife, or more like. Somalis in the media that is not like a typecasted, you know, for I don't want to mention names for, you know, 
certain actor and I don't get me wrong he's dope as shit but typecast it and it's pretty sad so having uh, an actor like Umar come out now is amazing having Khadr as a writer director is amazing and having others that are emerging right now is fucking amazing so it's it's I think it's yeah. the best time to to get out there and the best time to push and not be afraid you know yeah for sure I, I think within the next like 10 years it's going to be so much like Somali filmmakers have come out and so much Somali content that's actually like actually portraying us the right way and like yeah like I have, I have very high hopes for the future of like Somali filmmakers just seeing yeah. just seeing like in Toronto like not even mentioning like all the Minneapolis, Ottawa, all these different places. Like, like you said, Khadr's from where? He's from Finland, right? Yeah. So yeah, like all over the world, they're doing so much. So like it's I'm excited. I'm excited to see where, where they take it, where we yeah. all take it. I agree because previously from what I knew in terms of media and stuff like that growing up, because I, I started in, in, in design and art and fashion and things like that. So for me, it was like models like Iman and also Hilariously, Yasmin, who's from Toronto, who's also one of the leads in the film of the Grave Digger's Wife. Um, but also more recent, like like Somalis were there, at least they were either pirates or, or skinnies on the roof or Black Hawk Down or they were models. And that's the only thing we had, you know. So sadly, we would always go to this. It's not sad, but it's like we would go to this side and we'd be like, yeah, at least we're models. We're known to be like, but that's only the, the women. Where's the guys? We have, it's, we're portrayed horribly as men. Um, in that regard, but most people, if they don't know, here's a here's a little thing. It's like um, the head designer or of Balmain is basically half Somali, half Ethiopian, and he just found out, I think, a couple of years back. He didn't even know. He thought he was biracial of of, of just white and uh, black, but he's specifically Ethiopian and Somali, and that's hilariously awesome, you know. Yeah. So that's another thing. I remember, didn't he have like a documentary or something out where he's like, he was like looking for his mom or something, right? Yeah, he I was, uh, it's called, I think called Wonder Boy on Netflix. It's on Netflix. Uh, but yeah, okay. check it out, people. And on side note, people check that out. And that's another win for win, you know, Somalis, you know, the, that yeah. dopest designer, dopest black designer. And, yeah. and they just, they just played the Grave Digger's wife in Somalia too. That was huge. See, it's, it's, in a theater in Somalia. Yeah, I think so, that's that's probably like the biggest sign that things are changing for this generation. Oh, one hundred percent. Because then it shows that it's see back then in in Somali, there's a thing called uh, for those who don't know, it's like called rawayads, and it was stage plays, basically stage plays and things like that, and it was over the top theatrical. So it would you know, and then when they turned it into video, they would still act in the same way. It would be in these small act structures and things like that, and it would be campy. You know, it would be, it's comedy. It's mostly comedy. And it, their drama was hilarious, in my opinion, because it, it wasn't, like, you couldn't take it seriously. You know what I mean? So majority of the time when somebody's like threatening somebody or something horrible is happening, it's, it's, it's done so poorly. Don't get me wrong. I love the people. I still watch them. But still, it's done not in the way that we would want it to be done. Yeah, so nobody, nobody actually takes it serious. And if they probably have, the funny thing is they probably do take it seriously. They probably take it like so seriously, but it's like over the top. There's no levels and subtleties to this thing. It's not this um, this build up. It's straight from zero to a hundred, you know. Yeah. So, but there is a precedent in terms of Somalis are very well known for poetry, art, and things like that. Nomadic people and things like that. So it's not far fetched that we would go into film and things like that, or entertainment, or anything visual, really. Or, 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 or written, you know, so... It's land of the poets, right? Yeah, it's land, land of the poets. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. So it's a beautiful, beautiful time to be out there and putting out content and putting out amazing things. Yeah. For sure. For sure, man. Especially in Toronto. I don't know, like, what the scene is in other places, but right now it's like, like I said, it's crazy how many talented Somali filmmakers are here. Yeah. For those... So all these out there, if you want to be an actor, go talk to your local, whoever's doing videos. I was like, there's a few people that we know that just like took the leap and was in, I think, Tony's film. I think, it, um, I think the last film at, uh, was at Mona's place. So that's, 
I was like, once I saw that person, I was like, oh shit, that's dope. You actually, you're going for it. And I was super happy because at the end of the day, you just got to build this portfolio in any creative field. And it's like a resume. That's your resume. You need to build a portfolio of work. And if you want to be an actor, you got to get in as much things as you can and also document it. Because there's a certain level of, like, no one's going to see a stage play unless it's recorded. And most stage plays are not recorded. You know what I mean? So you, you, theater actors, if that's what you want to be, then yeah. But to to be in film and television and so, so on and so forth, you need to have your things recorded on video. And seen, as, sure. seen by as much as you can. Anytime you apply for funding for anything, whether it be, like, behind the camera or you want to be an actor or whatever, first thing they ask you is, like, what is like the past stuff you did? They ask for a reel, they yeah. ask for your past projects and your role on them. That's what I realized when I was first starting out, like I would apply for all these grants, I wouldn't get anything. And I, I had to think like, why am I not getting any of these things? And it was because I had like no history. Like nobody's gonna hand over this money when you, have, like, when you haven't proven yourself in that yeah. field in any way, right? That applies to so, everything like, in life. You know, or if you don't have that, that resume, they're not going to give you money. It's as simple as that. Oh yeah, it's, it's it's if you can even like that's on that's on the uh, funding side. And then there's there's if you have a project that you want to do, uh, there's this proof of concept aspect as well. Where if you're getting funding either funding either privately or things like that, you have to show that that same reel or whatever it is, or even a demo of what this project can be. Either one scene, one line, one thing. You know what I mean? It's like, um, like in Marvel films, they do previs. Literally, most if people don't know, most Marvel films are shot previs. It's all digital. It's like they know the shot for shot for shot for the most part. That how that's it. so. In if you're trying to get f- uh, funding and more for private, you gotta have that like um, demo or little scene or something like that, and it helps a lot um, in the long run. And, but that applies to everything in life. But um. No, it's it's a lot of a lot of cool things, and being fearless is 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 rewarded. Honestly, it is. You can't wait. You if you can't wait for a lot of things, you can't just wait and say I don't have a camera. If you don't have a camera, but you already you can uh, um, essentially provide another service, then you know tr- that's the way the world works. Like I'm a good this, you're a good that. Let's do something. You know, talk to people network and build because the universe doesn't yeah. wait for you yeah another avenue is you can apply to places like pov third street and like all these different workshops and labs where like pov third street for example they shoot they shoot a short at the end i think it's two shorts at the end of each program mm-hmm. and they'll provide all the cameras all the gear the crew everything so let's try to take advantage of all those different opportunities in the city CFC is something similar. It's just yeah, yeah. Try to take advantage of those. Go to go to these networking events. People are always looking for help on set. So yeah, there's a, there's always a way. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. And there's <laughs> my mind went black for a second. But it's there's there's many there's many opportunities. It's just you know you got to search for them. There's people shooting all the time, everywhere, and just put yourself out there at the end of the day. Yeah, don't worry too much about the quality at first, too. One one thing that kind of like held me back at first was like, oh, I don't have the, I don't have the best camera, I don't have the best gear, I don't have the best actors, I don't have money to pay people, this and that. But it's just, just try to grow from like each project. The first thing you do is most likely not going to be great. Yeah. Probably the second thing probably won't be great, but just try to improve a little bit on each one until it gets to that point where it is great. You know? Yeah, because look, at the end of the day, the technology that we have right now is crazy. Your phone is doing crazy things compared to what people used for a Super 8 camera. Mm-hmm. A Super 8 camera, it, it, there's a lot of films that were either Super 8, 16, and all these other cameras that it didn't matter about the gear it was about the story the technique uh everything it's the concept all these things you know made the film so at the end of the day don't worry about gear because the cell phone you have on your phone is more than enough 
you know but obviously like people like like i have gear and i'm a gear obsessed person and but also it's more of making the best of what you have so if you have this phone or you have like uh, a sony camera that i'm using you know there's it's it's all about how to use it in the best possible way like milking it in the best possible way so just use what you got yeah i agree so at the end of the day in terms of this industry or at least in toronto's industry what do you think could be better at least in this industry honestly because they don't post jobs. It's hard to get on things. And if you try to get on jobs and you're not in unions, they're going to be like, eh, you're not union. Even though you you have years of experience and you're just not in union, they're not going to hire you regardless. So there's a little bit of that going on, which I understand. And it's also annoying if you're not in a union. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So yeah. at least that's my, my, my current beefs about how the system works. But then the technology allows you to bypass that and get beyond those gatekeepers and get straight to these streaming platforms or get straight to these um, festivals or go straight to to these, um, for example, there's a lot of opportunities for writers labs or uh, what they call residencies. You know, residents, residencies from other countries to go right there and you know, your accommodations is some, depending on which it is, accommodations are paid for and taken care of and you get to write and present to the profession like the industry professionals of that place so there's a whole world that is that is that is out there for you if it's not canada there's the us and so on and so forth like this whole world yeah um like you said i would say just getting in like if you don't know anybody in the industry it's very hard it seems like um it's the same people that are in there and it's like Oh, it kind of seems like they don't, they don't want anybody new like coming in unless it's like their friends. So just like breaking in is definitely the hardest part. Um, I would also say the funding. The funding is like there's not a lot of it. Like th- there is a lot of funding opportunities, but it's not for enough money to make good things. Honestly, I think like I feel like. I don't want to. I don't want no, to say any. Say it. I'd rather you say it but. than because at the end of the day, um, you rather want like you want people to know the pitfalls, right? Yeah. And it's not that you're complaining that you're like oh, I can't do anything. It's more of listen, this is fucked up. I think it could be better. You know, there's a difference between saying you know this is shit and then you don't you don't you know uh, give advice on how it can be better. But in a sense, you know. So sorry. So don't sugarcoat. Don't hold. Don't hold back, man. Trust me. Don't hold back. Cause I don't, and I don't want to anymore. Because yeah. if you're doing this for life, and this is what your dream, and this is your passion, and this is the only thing you want to do, then you just you can't be, you know, polite all the time. It's not being an asshole, but it's also not being, um, you know, holding back uh, your words. So you don't have to be an asshole, but just sorry. Go for it. So. Yeah, so, like, I know you're going through the, the funding system right now. Like, what do you think? Do you think there's enough funding out there to make feature films? Like, honestly, to like the quality that you see in like the US and some of these other markets, what do you think? In Canada, we have a good, I'll admit that in Canada, we have a good funding system in the way it's it, the initial process is good, right? The initial process to get you going is good. But at a certain level beyond that, you're dead in the water. You know what I mean? Because yeah. Canada and the way they work is is restrictive. And they're trying to be very um, politically correct in certain aspects. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's you got to yeah, fit another, into this little say. box that has to be so super inclusive. Even though your work is already inclusive, you, you have to go even more further and more narrow to the point where it fits into this, like, in my opinion, the CBC guidelines. And I'm like, go fuck yourself. Being honest. Yeah. So if you're trying to create things that inspired you growing up, which is French cinema or uh, British cinema or US, uh, our neighbors to the South, which currently I'm in, it's fucking dope as always. But um, there's, they, they function differently. Even Europe functions differently. They take more risks 
you know, when it comes to Canada, they it's don't safe. take, they're very, they're very safe. safe. They're fiscally conservative yeah. and they don't, they, on a certain level, they support the arts, whether it's fine. Cause I came from fine arts as well. And I'm like all these grants and all these things. And like, you're, you're so safe. And then when someone, only when someone succeeds without you, you represent them because they came from Canada. And that happens in every creative industry, music and everything like that. A lot of Canadians have to leave and then come back and they're like, oh, we love this person. Even this person's like finally getting to be what they wanted to be and say what they, you know, be very honest with their art. And Canada, yeah. if you want to stick into the system, they kind of like, you know, push you into this little thing and you feel stifled on many levels. And it's throughout the system. It's a whole system where these people are essentially been in it too long and they they just make their cut off the top of everything. They're like, eh, just, just do this and then just work it up. You know, they make their money. So to them, they don't want to rattle the system. And even when they think they're rattling the system, they're really not. It's just what the current yeah. state of the world is and they're just following that little trend. They're not... They never break the mold. They never go against uh, anything. They never. They just go like this. Yeah. And and I'm I'm I've seen that firsthand, and I'm like, uh, and I've seen it in fashion here. Fat. There's a lot of. Sorry, I can go on and on about this. There's a whole topic I can go on and on, and I think I've done that yeah. in other podcasts on the sh- on the show, <laughs> but it's not only like in film. Me. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, like, for me, you, you obviously have more uh, experience in that field, just going through the development with your project now. I'm just, like, starting to get a taste of that, and it's, like, I can kind of see, like, why Canadian cinema has, like, no identity. It's, like, like you said, it's just following, like, what the things that are happening at the time is. Yeah. There's like, you take these risks, and it's, like... Like, horror. It, that's what horror in Canada is good. Like, if Canadians do horror, they do it because... I don't know yeah. what it is. It's so weird. Like you have to, you literally have to dismember people and call it a horror to get co- cool ideas. And that's fucking weird. Mm-hmm. It's very weird to me that that's the case because you see these horror films that are filmed in Canada, produced in Canada, and you're like, that's pretty cool on either Crave or, or, or I think it's Shudder, all these other like, you know, and then I'm like, if you want an indie film and I'm like, unless it doesn't fit this PC narrative or whatever the fuck it is, it's it's not supported unless you have private funding. See, that's that's the other aspect. A lot of these productions that you see here that are bigger productions are U.S. productions coming here and U.S. funding, and then they're getting tax credits and stuff like that, all these other things, and they come to Ontario mm-hmm. and or Vancouver or all these other places to film here. So it's not about them necessarily being 100% Canadian at all. They might hire certain crew members that are Canadian, you know, to fit some quota or whatever it is, but at the end of the day, it's an American production. It's like The Boys is filmed in Toronto, and that's the most blood, gore, and fucking craziness of a superhero show. You know what I'm trying to say? And it's because it's an American <laughs> production. If it was a CBC production, that wouldn't exist. Mm-hmm. So that tells you something, that Canadians are very safe and very annoying. But I love them, but annoying. Yeah, you could see, you can tell just by like the application process for these grants, the exact thing they're looking for, just the way they word it. It's like they're guiding you to this like this idea that they already have, and mm-hmm. all the questions are like taking you towards this idea of like what they want, basically. Yeah. Just asking like how you identify with this and this and that, and it's like yeah. like let's say you're like a black person that wants to do like let's say you want to write a romantic comedy and like. You're not getting funding for that. Fuck no. That has to be something about you, about you being black and like how that's affected you or in their own religion. wording. In their own wording, no. you're a racialized person, and yeah. that's their wording. That's literally their wording. And and when you yeah, <laughs> you yeah. apply like for it, I, but then you're it's you're laughing in the back of your mind, and I'm like, oh, I'm only getting this because I'm racialized. So on one part, yeah, I'm like, like it's money, right now? but yeah. If you apply right now to to get funding for a sci-fi fantasy, like you're you're not getting that. You're not, you're not getting, getting it. it. Unless it's like some sort of race element to it. Some yeah, sort if of there was gender. like space Nazis or space KKK, yeah. you know, lynching people in space, but how can they lynch them because they're floating? I don't know. Some fucking yeah, crazy fucking exactly. idea. You know what I'm trying to say? Um, so yeah, <laughs> almost forces you to like play up like 
Always um, play up the race card. Always. So like, I'm like, yeah. So I think that that's probably the biggest barrier. I wouldn't say barrier, but like the most annoying part of it, I'd say. Yeah, because Just it's like, it's it's play up like all your traumas and stuff to get money from from the government. Yeah, if it's government funded and or government uh, adjacent, then you're not gonna you're not like you can initially like get money initially to start the process but like i said that's what i was trying to say at a certain stage you cannot rely on the same system that like at least kickstarted you in the beginning you have to go straight international right away look for international funding look for private funding etc cetera, etc cetera. you know kickstarters you name it go for everything because at the end of the day that same system is going to come after you you know it's it's yeah, I've, I've experienced certain things firsthand. Like I said, I'll go back to a certain snippet of in fashion where these huge celebrated designers that were Canadian were still struggling because the market wasn't here and all of them had to leave. And I'm like, these people, like, I've, they're, they're amazing. But yet, and then when I went to film as well, I'm like, what the fuck is going on? So it's more of a Canadian mindset. And it's sad, yeah. sad to say. And I've seen this over, what was it? It's coming up to like at least over 10 years that I've experienced this whole thing and this whole process. And it's very sad. And it's not changed. It's changed. It's only going to get worse. Only going to get worse. It's only going to get more restrictive. Only going to, you know, you can't say this. You can't do this. You can't, even though, even though you're part of these communities and things like that, you can't do this, you can't do that. They're, they're, and it's not even run by people that are represented by those communities most of the time. Yeah, it's hilarious. So that, that's the most annoying part. Mm-hmm. Is that they're not they're not actually run by the people from most communities. No, only now they're starting to put these. They're scrambling to put these people in these in these positions. But even those people in those positions are are sadly tokenized. They're just put in there quickly because they look this way and they have some semblance of some resume that has things. But they don't know how these people function. You know what I'm trying to say? They were, it's like yeah. basically like, you're black, you're this, you're that. All right, get the fuck in there. That's, that's yeah. how I feel. It's, it, that's what's going on. And that doesn't help the people you think you're helping. That only makes it worse. So. No, I agree. I think I'm, I'm probably a little bit more optimistic about the future than you. I, no, I, I think am it can. overall. But as a Canadian, mm-hmm. as a Canadian and growing up in Toronto, I'm like, I've seen it on every level uh, from the single artist, you know, trying to make it to corporation and things like that because it's, it's uh, got a lot of crazy stories. Talking to people here, like everywhere, it's, it's fucking crazy. And Canadians are... You don't think... Sorry, go ahead. You don't think like if a certain film comes out that kind of like breaks all those conventions, you don't think like they would kind of like pivot... Uh trying to do like more of no, it because we like had so. much what is it french canadian uh directors uh, that did mommy or um uh and uh del neuve basically did dune and he did uh blade runner and he's from these french canadian like you see it in in quebec but then they also leave because also france themselves supports these french canadian artists because they know that's their connection you see what I'm trying to say but if it's english speaking yeah. you have nobody Unless you go to the States, you really are stuck with Canada. You know what I mean? So yeah. you have these amazing directors coming out of Montreal and all those French Canadians. And and then they always leave. They always leave because they can. Because France is a good supporter of the arts. They have cans. They have all these other programs. They have all these other... They're really supportive. Right? And mm-hmm. in the U.S., they're supportive more in financial, like private finance. So you get these issues you have these issues where if you're french if you're english speaking um uh work you have literally less less wiggle room in canada honestly unless it's uh, indigenous unless it's uh uh, sexualized or anything like that you're really this you know i'm trying to say and even that even if you do fit into these categories you're still this and it's sad so i have hope for the rest of the world because the rest of the world has access to more technology, just like here. So the more industries pop up in, you know, Africa's getting huge. It's huge already. In fashion, it's getting huge. So 
get the if you can and if you need to get the fuck out i love you canada but some people don't have to be here yeah. not here but Depressing. where i was yeah Depressing. you might be right though no it's not it's not to say that you you have to do this it just means that if you're okay with the current system that you're in that guides you down a safe path then by all means I'm not going to be mad at you. Like everyone has their free will and free choice. Do that. By all means, do that. But if you're a person like myself who doesn't want to be pigeonholed by mediums, number one, industries and the way they function and all those other things, and you know how to network and you know how to get out there and you're not beholden to one idea and you're constantly working on multiple ideas and you know how to bring them to fruition, it's just a matter of networking and finance, fuck get the fuck out of here if go where people love you don't stay where people don't love you go where people love you and that applies to everything that's true <laughs> yeah man it's true man yeah. amen but yeah man we got to do this more and there's more people in that group that we know i'm gonna throughout this week and other weeks coming up that i'm gonna be talking to as well um i know i did a pre-video for this uh sh- uh shouting out to in terms of your Instagram stuff like that but tell people where to find all your work and social media and everything Uh, social media the only one I really actually use is Instagram Uh, Instagram handle is Rob Lito so that's R-O-B L-I-T zero so not O zero Rob Lito yeah. And from there, you can find my Vimeo page, you can find my IG, everything. So, yeah, look me up. All right. All right. So, if people want to pronounce his name correctly, it's either Rob or. Robla. There you go. There's a Somali pronunciation. All right. I always make fun of him because that's. It's, I, I know Rob is rain. Yeah. Either le means ra- either rain with rain or rain less. I forgot which one it meant. Like I think it's with rain. Rob le. Yeah. Le is at the. Correct me if I'm wrong. So many people don't hate on me, but his name has rain in it. Okay. And it's Rob le. Yeah. All right. It was raining on this one. There you go. That's why you're called Rob le. You know. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> but. It's like people, they're so like some of these names are hilarious because it's other like other country, cultural names from other countries. It's like the name of something, the place or thing, or the the tribe is called something, you know, um, hilarious names, some horrible names that are people still like. I don't want to get into that's a whole other private conversation where people call themselves the what? So that's a whole nother podcast. That's a whole nother podcast that Somalis need to change their names, but it's hilarious and it sticks and they still like even even a town's name that I've that I've yeah. uh, that I, I haven't been to but I've been like closer close to is called something hilarious. And I'll talk about that offline. But yeah. All right, people. Uh, this is Rob and this is me, my the cosmic nomad. Till next time, this is <laughs> as its own uh, I forgot the, even the name of my own show. <laughs> this is Creative Weirdos on every yeah, streaming like platform that. on YouTube and everything like that. So until next time, peace, weirdos. Hey, weirdos. It's my the Cosmic Nomad, and we've just dropped the dope Black Nomad shirt, actually. It's pretty nice. Um, <laughs> sorry, I got one hand on the mic and everything like that, but... You know, it's pretty nice. And the print quality is amazing. It's another hand-drawn weird beautifulness, but with a retro vibe. And you can check it out. It's like, yeah, you can see that. Let me, give me one second. Yeah. Goes up to goes up to like 3x whoever wants 3x all the way down to small and we have um, dark heather white gray and black and in the hoodies we have the similar 
we also have the new Africa, you know, the Pan Africa sweater and uh, Pan Africa shirt and hat, though. So check that out. So don't forget to like and subscribe on the video and share the podcast as well as the videos. And if you see us on Instagram, like and share. Till next time, I'm Mai the Cosmic Nomad. Peace.